Muito boa noite a todos. É uma grande honra e um grande prazer participar desse importante evento internacional que trata de tema tão caro para todos nós, para a sobrevivência do planeta. Quero agradecer especialmente ao ministro Elma Benjamin, meu querido amigo, pelo convite e me permitir ter o prazer de participar, de presidir esse último painel dessa noite, talvez, acho que é o último, e que trata de um tema que para mim é extremamente caro, que é a questão da biodiversidade. E ouvindo a doutora Elizabeth Merema se manifestar sobre as questões relativas à biodiversidade, fiquei aqui pensando da grande dificuldade que a crise da biodiversidade tem trazido para todos nós para dar uma resposta efetiva, concreta, para as extinções das espécies que acontecem agora, nesse momento, nesse minuto, enquanto nós estamos aqui falando a situação, como todos nós aqui sabemos, e aqui eu não vou pregar para convertidos, como todos nós, nós estamos aqui, na verdade, fazendo o exercício de um mantra, repetindo incansavelmente os mesmos princípios que nós acreditamos piamente, mas que nós precisamos fazer esse exercício de repetir os valores ambientais que nós prezamos para tentar convencer, convencer novas pessoas, novos governantes, ou seja, aqueles que decidem o destino dos recursos e os destinos políticos dos países. A biodiversidade, eu falo rapidamente, só com uma nota meramente introdutória desse meu painel, é um tema que para mim é extremamente caro, não só pela questão da prospecção da biodiversidade, que eu gosto de fazer, mas também na questão da conservação da biodiversidade e os múltiplos fatores ambientais que estão intrinsecamente ligados a essa manutenção da biodiversidade. O clima, até então, foi apenas um desses fatores. O clima não foi, por exemplo, o fator determinante do Havaí ter chegado ao título de capital mundial da extinção de espécies, especialmente da avifauna, mas não somente da avifauna. Na verdade, os fatores determinantes desse título de capital do mundo da extinção foi a ocupação humana, a ocupação humana e tudo relacionado a essa ocupação humana. Chegamos, entretanto, a um momento em que a crise ambiental reuniu todos esses fatores que, por exemplo, atingem a biodiversidade, ganhou força num único fator, um fator é, que se tornou o um fator preponderante, que é a mudança global do clima, afetar todos os demais fatores e, portanto, com força, com dimensão, com escala suficiente para ser comparada a uma, a um período, aos efeitos de um período geológico. A questão da biodiversidade passou a apenas a ser um singelo capítulo dentro dessa realidade. O surgimento de novos patógenos ditos pela ciência, ou pelos pesquisadores, isso aí não seria novidade, é apenas um singelo capítulo dessa realidade global de mudança do clima. É inegável que o mundo passa, pela, não por uma transformação, o mundo não mais se transforma, que a transformação pressupõe uma, uma sucessão de acontecimentos, de estados. Nós estamos vivendo uma verdadeira metamorfose e o Covid, a pandemia, apenas foi um bom exemplo dessa metamorfose. A metamorfose a que alude o sociólogo Ulrich Beck, por exemplo, metamorfose do mundo, fatores que fazem com que a, é, vamos dormir de um jeito, acordamos de outro jeito. Eu acredito que a ideia do, do catastrofismo emancipador obrigue para o bem ou para o mal a que nós que estamos aqui repetindo nossos valores ambientais como mantra, é, consigamos é, de alguma forma é, adaptar essa nova realidade metamorfoseada do mundo para talvez encaminhar para um mundo melhor, talvez conseguir, talvez e muito talvez conseguir 
manter uma pequena parcela da biodiversidade. Como eu disse, se perde a todo momento, a todo minuto, a todo segundo. Então, ninguém melhor para falar sobre essa conexão Climate Change, Biodiversity, Environmental Rule of Law, do que a nossa keynote speaker, a doutora Cristina Foyt, que é professora da Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de Oslo, da Noruega, e chair da International Union for Conservation of Nature, da World Commission on Environmental Law. Tenho o prazer, portanto, de passar a palavra a doutora Cristina Foyt. Muito obrigada, Justice Leme, dear friends, dear colleagues. The title of my talk is, as Justice Leme just said, Climate Change, Biodiversity and the Rule of Law. But it is, in essence, really about our collective future. It is my hypothesis that our future depends to a very significant extent on law, on law as a lever to bring about systemic changes, on the kind of laws that are being enacted and implemented and enforced by the judiciary now. And by that, on the members of the legal profession, our future does depend on law and lawyers. Law is a governance tool to translate science, ideas, plans into real action on the ground. Of course, there are other tools as well that govern human behavior, like an appeal to ethics or moral behavior, religious guidance, financial incentives or disincentives, education, and so forth. But history has shown that systemic changes have almost always been anchored in the legal structures, be it in constitutional provisions that spelled out human or liberty rights, be it in court decisions that ended structural racial discrimination or required transparency about the fatal effects of cigarette smoking or in laws that, for example, establish nature reserves or protect the rights of indigenous people or internalize environmental costs of pollution. These are only examples, but these are examples of how law can cause and has caused sustained systemic changes. And it is those changes, those transformative changes that are needed now more than ever. And when I say now, it is now. It is in this decade, the decade until 2030, which is often termed as the critical decade. And even the parties that have come to Glasgow recognize that we're currently talking about the critical decade. And this critical decade presents an opportunity for lawyers and for judges but it also presents an unprecedented responsibility. Let me say a couple of words of why this is a critical decade and what the role of law and the environmental rule of law therein is and what kind of lawyers and judges we need. So why a critical decade? Many of you, especially those that have been around for a while, have heard this many times before. The time to act is now. And yet little happened. The time to act is always now. But this decade, this current decade, according to science, is the last decade where we have it in our hands to adjust our behavior to ensure that planetary boundaries are not crossed. Changing behavior is never easy. It is cumbersome, it is hard, you may be criticized, sometimes ridiculed, often marginalized by the mainstream, by those that want comfortable business as usual, but it is necessary. 
Scientific consensus, as assessed in the global reports published by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, and the Intergovernmental Science and Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBS, is clear on where we are headed with business as usual. The combined and mutually enhancing crises of runaway climate change, global biodiversity loss and massive pollution and destruction of marine and terrestrial ecosystems undermine the basis of relative global stability. They undermine the basis of prosperity and order of life as we know it. They threaten human welfare and security. They unravel economic systems and social systems and destroy the very book of life before we even could read it. Scientists have over many decades warned about the devastating effects of humans on natural systems, but they have never spoken so clearly and never with greater certainty and force and urgency as in those recent scientific reports. The IPC states in its sixth assessment reports published only a couple of months ago that global warming is very likely to reach an overshoot 1.5 degrees um, around 2030 if no immediate and drastic emission reductions are taken. All emission scenarios that the IPCC outlines in the near term may exceed 1.5 degrees and only one out of five scenarios stands a chance of very likely keep temperatures well below two degrees by the end of the century. And this scenario requires immediate deep emission reductions of all greenhouse gases right away, reaching global net zero emissions of carbon dioxide around 2050 and deep negative emissions thereafter until the end of the century. In all other scenarios, temperature increases may range from 2.4 to all the way to 5.7 degrees centigrade, uh, centigrade by the end of the century. Dear colleagues, the last European summer has shown how a runaway climate looks like. It looks devastating, unplanable, and ultimately unlivable in many places. If this is the reality now, with only 1.1 degree warming, how will the world look like for our children and the generations thereafter? It will detrimentally and unfairly affect those that are already vulnerable today. Children, migrants, women, the poor, and those that are not born yet. Every degree of warming, and honestly, every ton of CO2 emissions into the atmosphere will increase the probability of severe droughts, of fires, of famine, of heavy precipitation, will be a risk to health, livelihoods, food security, water supply, and eventually human security. And yet, we are currently headed towards three, perhaps four degrees of warming. Similarly, the IPBS report on biodiversity shows that nature across the globe has been significantly altered by humans with more species threatened by extinction than ever before. This poses a serious risk to global food security and the resilience of agricultural systems. The rate of global change in nature and natural systems is unprecedented in human history with the largest global impact coming from land and sea use change, direct exploitation of organism, pollution, and again, like Justin Slemon said, from climate change. The situation means that most societal and environmental goals and international agreements, like those embedded in the Aichi targets, as uh, Elizabeth Rehmer mentioned, um, under the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, but also the Sustainable Development Targets will most likely not be achieved unless we change our current trajectory. And yet we still have a chance. But the chance depends on the choices we make in this decade. 
As mentioned by the IPCC report, it is very clear what needs to be done. Similarly, the IPBS report states that nature can be conserved, restored, and sustainably managed if the main drivers are addressed. If habitat fragmentation and the conversion of forests and other natural lands into agricultural land and other development projects is halted and reversed, pollution and invasive species tackled, climate change mitigated. If all this is done, we might be able to bend the curve of those crises upon us. However, both reports state very clearly that this can only be achieved through transformative change. This is the fundamental system-wide reorganization across economic, social, and technological factors, including our paradigms, our goals, and our values. The IPCC specified that these system transitions are unprecedented in terms of scale and urgency. And the time span for making informed decisions is short. According to science, these changes have to happen within the next 10 years so that they can show their effects around 2050. And this is why we speak of a critical decade. Beyond this decade, any changes may simply come too late if they come at all, as natural processes will most likely have taken an irre irreversible turn. And in that scenario, we will have to deal with the consequences of our collective inactions and inabilities to change. Consequences that would set an end to the order, including the judicial order as we know it, and give rise to unilateralism, instability, insecurity, and the use of might. So what is the role of law in all of this? The reports that I mentioned, they strengthen, they call on strengthening the global response to climate change, biodiversity climate crisis, pollution crisis, and to enhancing international cooperation. Climate change and global biodiversity loss as collective action problems can only be effectively addressed through a system of international cooperation, of management and implementation support. In other words, there is a crucial role for international law and also for lawyers working in this field, not only in creating a global level playing field that avoids free riding, but in creating the legal structures necessary for a coordinated response commensurate with these global challenges. But not only international law is needed, legal responses and changes at all levels are necessary, including regional, national, local, all the way to village levels. The need for law is clearly stressed in the IPBS report. One main intervention, they call it lever, to generate transformative change by tackling the direct, indirect drivers of the deterioration of nature is, so they report, environmental law, an idea to add the environmental rule of law and its effective implementation. Using this level will involve developing incentives and widespread capacity for environmental responsibility, eliminating perverse incentives, reforming sectoral and segmented decision-making, taking preemptive and precautionary action and managing for resilient social and ecological systems in the face of uncertainty and complexity to deliver decisions that are robust and wise in a wide range of scenarios and strengthening environmental laws and policies and their implementation. In short, what is needed is a large scale and upscaled implementation of the environmental rule of law. So what does the environmental rule of law mean for lawyers, for judges, for legal scholars, and all that work with the law? It means that we need lawyers and judges that are well informed, that understand the science, the urgency, and the implications of inaction. 
We need lawyers and judges that act on a sense of duty, duty of care, of diligence, wisdom, solidarity, dignity, and respect and responsibility. And we need lawyers that dare to think outside the box, that are visionary, who seek innovative solutions, who think unthought thoughts and push the boundaries of our legal knowledge. We need those thinkers and intellectual leaders. And we need lawyers that work inside the box, that interpret, apply, implement, and enforce the environmental laws that we have, that review them and revise them and amend them with the aim to make them stronger, better, more effective, and support legislative proposals that enhance environmental protection. But this does not only apply to the box of environmental law. This applies to all legal boxes, be they human rights law, or trade and investment law, criminal law, constitutional law, private contract law. There are so many different fields. And as Inge Anderson said, we all are environmental lawyers now. We all are environmental judges now. In all these fields, we need lawyers and judges with strong environmental expertise to ensure that the advances of environmental protection are not made futile by the dictates of other areas of law by the protection of property rights, for example, without the due recognition of their ecological function, or by the dictates of trade and investment protection. And finally, we need lawyers that do away with the boxes and that consider the big picture, that address issues of silos, of fragmentation, as we just heard, that deal with the integration of different areas of law that deal with planetary boundaries and planetary level and try to address the shortcomings of the legal system where they exist. Lawyers that work beyond the dictates of time, space, and species, and that consider global issues as well as intertemporal and future rights of those generations not yet born. And that include the non-human world in legal deliberations of justice and of fairness. We need lawyers in all legal professions from all corner of the legal community, including practicing lawyers, judges, academics, civil servants, company lawyers, law students, diplomats, lawmakers, and all others working in and within the law. And we need them everywhere, in all countries, all levels, all ages, gender, and levels of career. We need lawyers that protect and use the law as a shield. And we need lawyers that fight and use the law as a sword. Together, and only together, we can initiate and foster and sustain the changes, the systemic changes necessary to avert climate and nature catastrophes and transition our societies and laws towards a sustainable future. By mobilizing the tools of our shared legal vocation, we can make a difference. This requires all of us to recognize and practice individual as well as institutional responsibility for the fate of planet Earth, our shared and only home. Thank you very much again for inviting me and congratulations to this important Congress.